My name is uh, Chris Vieira, pastor of the church. Been here 15 years, and uh, it's my pleasure to try to, uh, ooh, excuse me, to try to wake people up, no matter what means it is, for you to stop taking the Lord for granted, because let's face it, we all do. Uh, becomes ordinary. I think sometimes we tone out things that sound religious to us that we've heard uh, put the same way each time. So I was hoping to bring you a message today that might jar you to see the significance of what Jesus has done. Uh, that what Easter, uh, why Easter is so special to us was that not, Jesus did not just die for your sins, but that he accomplished something quite necessary in order for him to reign uh, in this world and in our lives. So uh, I'm going to share a little bit of a message with you. I do want to excuse any kids, kindergarten to third grade, that would like to go to our kids' Sunday school. I have Elizabeth here, and she's going to teach a little lesson. All right, I think that's it. They're looking at someone. <laughs> We do have activity boxes, too. We, we love having the kids in the service if they, they're here. And uh, so where do we begin? We've got to begin somewhere. Why don't we begin in the trial uh, of Jesus before Pilate? We're going to come back to that. But ultimately, my message today is going to revolve around how to slay a dragon. And uh, I hope you already understand that there is no real dragon, but there is a real Satan, that, uh, that Satan exists and uh, he was uh, ruling over the world until Christ came. Um, so why don't we uh, turn in our Bibles to uh, John chapter 18. And I'm going to be looking at the uh, resurrection, the, the death and resurrection accounts in John. There's a lot of information in each of the Gospels. But uh, today I'll, I'll just be looking at John. And why don't we just begin with uh, chapter 18 of the book of John. Now, I'd like to read verses 28 through 36. And what we usually do is pray after that point. Um, pray that God has our attention, that uh, we're listening and ready to apply what, what you learned today. You could be praying for me too, right? That I uh, can present God's word well and even end on time. We need pray, prayer for that. So, uh, so starting in verse 28, it says... Jesus' trial before Caiaphas ended in the early hours of the morning. And then he was taken to the headquarters of the Roman governor, and his accusers didn't go inside because it would defile them, and they wouldn't be allowed to celebrate the Passover. So Pilate, the governor, went out to them and asked, What is your charge against this man? We wouldn't have handed him over to you if he weren't a criminal, they retorted. And then take, him, then take him away and judge him by your own law, Pilate told them. Only the Romans are permitted to execute someone, the Jewish leaders replied. This fulfilled Jesus' prediction about the way he would die. And then Pilate went back into his headquarters and called for Jesus to be brought to him. Are you the king of the Jews, he asked. And Jesus replied, is this your own question, or did others tell you about me? Am I a Jew, Pilate retorted? Your own people and their leading priests brought you to me for trial. Why? What have you done? And Jesus answered, my kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. If it were, my followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish leaders. But my kingdom is not of this world. And Pilate said, so are, you are a king? And Jesus responded, you say that I am a king. Actually, I was born and came into the world to testify to the truth. All who love the truth recognize that what I say is true. What is truth, Pilate asked. And then he went out again to the people and told them, He is not guilty of any crime, but you have a custom of asking me to release one prisoner each year at Passover. Would you like me to release this king of the Jews? But they shouted back, No, not this man. We want Barabbas. Barabbas was a revolutionary. 
And then Pilate had Jesus flogged with lead-tipped whip, and the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on a purple robe on him. Hail, King of the Jews, they mocked as they slapped him across the face. Pilate went outside again and said to the people, I am going to bring him out to you now, but understand clearly that I find him not guilty. And then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said, Look, here is the man. And when they saw him, the leading priests and the temple guards, they began shouting, Crucify him, crucify him. Take him yourselves and crucify him, Pilate said. I find him not guilty. Why don't we stop there and take a moment to pray, and I'll share with you my message. Lord, it's, uh, it's heart-wrenching to think of all the suffering that you went through. You were innocent, you were sinless, yet you came to be a sacrifice in our place. And uh, it's too amazing to wrap our heads around sometimes, Lord, but today's a day that the world will recognize you. They don't understand what we celebrate today, the fact that you went to the cross for us and and you showed that you were victorious through the resurrection. So we pray that as I share my message that everyone here, their hearts and minds are ready to receive it. I pray that you help me as well to, uh, to preach in a way that will be helpful and useful for the lives of those here today. We thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Well, all right, one thing that I've been doing since I've gotten here is have a uh, explorer sheet. We used to call them scribe sheets, but if you have a bulletin, uh, you should have one of these. And these are are a way in which to uh, help you and to help me stay on track. Uh, I am prone for wandering. um, But this is going to keep us on the topic at hand, and it's how to slay a dragon. And what I do each week is to put on here in green text, if you forget everything I say to you, Don't forget this one thing, this main idea, this most important point. And uh, this week, I think it's appropriate, given the topic at hand, that the main idea is that the spikes on Jesus' cross became the nails in Satan's coffin. Let me say that again. The spikes in Jesus' cross became the nails in Satan's coffin. What Jesus Christ accomplished on that cross uh, was necessary in order, for, in order for him to provide a way for us uh, to worship him as king, king of this world. So uh, you might be asking, slay the dragon. And I, I kind of like putting something out on the sign that makes people scratch their head and go, what, what is this guy talking about? Is he off his rocker? Maybe you thought the same, and, uh, you know, but... Uh, That's me, right? I I want to at least try to get people's attention that what happened on Easter is not ordinary. It's extraordinary. It's powerful. And it should change lives. And uh, as I thought about this concept of a dragon, uh, I know there's kind of a a fun movie out. Anyone ever see the movie How to Train Your Dragon? That's not the dragon I'm talking about. That's the the movie about, uh, apparently, there's this story about a mythical Viking village and... uh, this character, Hiccup, has to go and, and uh, kill the dragon, and he finds that it's a, actually a cute dragon, a dragon he'd like to get to know. That's not the dragon we're talking about this morning. The dragon we're talking about, I guess if we think about it, maybe you're already thinking about what's one of the uh, historical dragons we think about. I was thinking about Smog. Smog is the dragon and the main antagonist in Tolkien's 1937 novel, The Hobbit. Uh, He was the one sitting on the treasure in the mountain. And he was ultimately the goal of the quest. He was powerful and fearsome. And he invaded the dwarf kingdom uh, 171 years prior to when the the Hobbit story began. And a, a group of 13 dwarves mounted a quest to take the kingdom back, aided by the wizard Gandalf and the Hobbit Bilbo Baggins. In The Hobbit, Thorin describes Smog as a most specially greedy, strong, and wicked worm. That's the kind of dragon I'm talking about here today. Satan is the dragon, and he is someone that is sitting on the treasure, uh, conquering for himself uh, what this world has to offer. 
and uh, 13 dwarves did not go to conquer smog. Jesus Christ came to earth to conquer Satan. And I'm here today to tell you the spikes on his cross were the nails in Satan's coffin. And that's what we celebrate today. Jesus was victorious in his mission. So as we think about it, what exactly does it take to, what are the steps in slaying a dragon? The first point on your explorer sheet, and I I put blanks there. My wife says I have to keep them there. She likes having those. That first point is to be sure it needs to go, right? This is not something that we leave unaddressed. Satan could not be left undealt with in this world. God knew that. And maybe you're wondering, uh, why am I giving such prominence to Satan? Really, the scriptures present Satan as being the God of this world. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 3 and 4, it says, If the good news we preached is hidden behind a veil, it is hidden only from people who are perishing. And look what it says. It says, Satan who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. And they are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. The scriptures uh, present Satan as being the God of this world. And ultimately, the question is, is... uh, How in the world was Christ going to reign as king if there was already someone sitting on the throne? If you're wondering this morning, why did Christ have to die? I'm hoping that you include that in your understanding. He died to pay the penalty of your sin. The debt that you owe God, Christ paid in full. But in the process, he threw Satan off the throne in this world. In order for the uh, Messiah to assume the position of king over the world, it would be necessary first to unseat the world's existing king. So that first step, be sure it needs to go. Satan needed to go. And we know this world, it exists in two parallels, two different dimensions, right? A physical and a spiritual. And Satan was in in a way the ruler of this world. In John chapter 12, uh, Jesus predicts his death. Speaking of what's going on, this is uh, John 12, 27. It says, now my soul is deeply troubled. This is what, as Jesus was coming to the realization, not the realization, expressing and demonstrating what exactly he was there to do. And he said, now my soul is deeply troubled. Should I pray, Father, save me from this hour? But this is the very reason I came. Father, bring glory to your name. Why did Christ die on the cross? It wasn't an unfortunate series of events. It was the very reason he came. It goes on to say, a voice spoke from heaven saying, I have already brought glory to my name and I will do so again. And when the crowd heard the voice, some thought it was thunder, while others declared an angel had spoken to him. And then Jesus told them, the voice was for your benefit, not mine. And look what it says, verse 31, it says, the time for judging this world has come when Satan, the ruler of this world, will be cast out. What did Christ accomplish on the cross He would cast Satan off of his throne so that he could sit and reign. And that's worth celebrating. John 16, uh, verse 11 says, Judgment will will come because the ruler of this world has already been judged. Satan sat in a seat of prominence that he was about to lose. Satan is seen as the one who tempted mankind to sin. We know in the Garden of Eden, right? And as a consequence, he brought the whole race under. And really, there's a veil that was looming over humanity to that point. Isaiah 25, we've been going through the book of Isaiah. 
Verse 7 says about what Christ would accomplish. He would remove the cloud of gloom, the shadow of death that hangs over the earth. We know uh, an interesting thing. I don't know if you've ever uh, read the Old Testament, but there's not a lot of talk about demons in the Old Testament. There's an occasional mention of an evil spirit, like the evil spirit that tormented Saul, and uh, there were mediums who would uh, have unfamiliar spirits. But we see in the New Testament that spiritual activity was in an uproar. Demon possession was something going on and was visible, and the people were dealing with it. And one of the major parts of Jesus' ministry when he came was not only healing leper, leprosy and you know, uh, people that were crippled and blind, but he was also casting demons. Satan was controlling the spiritual realm and things were stirring up. Something was happening. Matthew 12, 27, uh, they were challenging uh, Jesus' authority over the demons. And he says, if I'm empowered by Satan, what about your own exorcists? They cast out demons too, so they will condemn you for what you said. But if I am casting out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has arrived among you. For who is powerful enough to enter the house of a strong man like Satan and plunder his goods? Only someone even stronger, someone who could tie him up and then plunder his house. Why did Jesus come to die? It was not to pay the debt of your sins alone. It was to bring judgment against the God of this world so that he could be removed from the throne. Because of sin and, and uh, the law, Satan is described in the scriptures as our accuser. He's the one that points and says, this one, because of his sin, cannot uh, be your child. 1 Corinthians 15, 56 says, For sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. And Satan liked that. Satan holds that over uh, the unrepentant sinner. And who's a sinner? Romans 3.23 says, For everyone has sinned, we all fall short of God's glorious standard. Every single one of us is a sinner. And Romans 6.23 reveals what that means. It says the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. The realm of death was the just consequences of sin, and that's Satan's kingdom. Whoever has sinned has inadvertently surrendered to his mastery. So, we need to be sure that he needs to go and hopefully understand how important it was that someone would take power over Satan. The second point, I guess as you're thinking, you know, if you're going to take out a dragon, know that he needs to go. The next thing is to know where he's hiding. I think it's pretty apparent he's hiding in this world. He was in this world and he was ruling over in the shadows and drawing us uh, into all sorts of sin and uh, depravity. The third point on your Explorer sheet, just so I can keep moving along here, is uh, if we're going to slay a dragon, we need to find its weak spot. And I don't know how much you know about Satan, but there's some little hints in the scriptures about what his biggest problem was. Anyone kind of want to make a guess? What was Satan's biggest problem? It starts with a P. He was proud. In Isaiah 14, if you've never read this, turn, uh, flip to Isaiah 14 in your Bible. Here, it's speaking against kings of the world, but oftentimes God folds in some insight into that spiritual realm. We know that there are kings in the world, but there's a king who's ruling behind the scenes, who influences uh, those who are in the world. And Isaiah gives us a little bit of hint of what uh, Satan's weakness was. I don't know if you remember the movie, The Hobbit. What was the, uh, you know, smog was able to be defeated because what did they find? What did Bilbo Baggins notice as the dragon was moving around? There was a hole in his scales, right? 
There was that little soft spot that was exposed, and Bilbo Baggins brought that information to uh, Bard the bowman, right? And he took his, his bow, and he shot that arrow, and that arrow found the weak spot and killed Smog. Pride is the weak spot of Satan. It's the reason why he fell from being an angel. It says in Isaiah 14, 12, How you are fallen from heaven, O shining star, son of the morning. You have been thrown down to earth, you who destroyed the nations of the world. For you said to yourself, I will ascend to heaven and set my throne above God's stars. I will preside on the mountain of the gods far away in the north, and I will climb to the highest heavens and be like the most high. Instead, you will be brought down to the place of the dead, down to its lowest depths. Everyone there will stare at you and ask, can this be the one who shook the earth and made the kingdoms of the world tremble? Satan began as God's greatest angel, and because of his pride and desire to be equal uh, to his creator, he fell. And let's face it, isn't that our problem? <laughs> Proverbs sixteen eighteen says, pride goes before destruction and haughtiness before a fall. Pride would be Satan's undoing, and Jesus knew full well so as long as sin and death maintained their universal grip on the human race, Satan was in his element, retaining control over those subject, subjects to him, the ruler of this world. No matter how powerful and wealthy you might become in this world, it's an illusion. Ezekiel 18.20 says, The person who sins is the one who will die. Wicked people will be punished for their own wickedness. That was the power held over us. The next thing we're going to think about as we think about slaying a dragon, knowing it needs to go, knowing where it's hiding, knowing its weak spot, the next thing we need is a hero, right? Someone who has the power to slay the dragon. And we know who that is, right? The Lord Jesus Christ is our hero. We needed him to overthrow the ruler's grip on everyone, someone that was not under the spell and curse of sin and death, a sinless person who would be exempt from the claims of death upon him since it is only the soul who sins that must die. Hebrews 4.15 shares a wonderful insight. It says, Jesus, this high priest, of ours understands our weaknesses for he faced all the same testings we do yet he did not sin in John 14:28 uh, verse 30 excuse me 14:30 Jesus says I don't have much more time to talk to you because the ruler of this world approaches he has no power over me Jesus said the ruler of this world approaches but he has no power over me. Isn't it true that the spikes of Jesus' cross were going to become the nails in Satan's coffin? He was on mission. He was fulfilling the plan. What if such a hero were to subject himself to the, that undeserved penalty? Jesus had exemption from the penalty of death, which he deliberately did not claim for himself. Suppose that God was willing to credit that unclaimed exemption to the account of undeserving but repentant sinners. What if God could take that credit and transfer it to us? That's exactly what happens when someone trusts in Jesus Christ. The credit that Jesus had on the cross was given to our benefit. So we need to find a hero, and Jesus is that hero. Let me continue. Uh, it says in Isaiah 35, 10, those who have been ransomed by the Lord will return. We've been going through Isaiah. It's, it's amazing. Actually, Isaiah 35 was where we were last week. And at chapter 35, if you have a, a chance, write that down, Isaiah 35. It's so beautiful. It speaks about 
all that God would do for those who would turn to him. He would turn deserts into gardens. But within that, there was a statement being made. It says, those who have been ransomed by the Lord will return. They will enter Jerusalem singing, crowned with everlasting glory. Sorrow and mourning will disappear, and they will be filled with joy and gladness. Those who have been ransomed. Death by unjustly seizing one uh, over whom it had no rightful claim is thus itself condemned. By Satan crucifying Jesus, he didn't understand or even recognize that it was going to be his own undoing. Jesus took the weak spot of Satan and would use it against him in order to dethrone his authority. So once uh, his authority would be abdicated, meaning his kingship would be renounced, uh, he would be dethroned. And that vacant office of the world ruler would then be up to God to fill, naturally with the one who had dethroned the prior king. The devil thus fell into God's trap by engineering Christ's crucifixion, causing his own defeat in the process. That is what we celebrate today, not just the fact that Christ uh, stood in our place, but that Christ would push Satan off of his place of authority and would begin to reign over the earth. And we need his authority and we need his guidance in our lives. So choosing an able hero, that able hero is Christ. That fifth point on your explorer sheet is... uh, We need to verify that it's vanquished, right? If we're going to slay a dragon, not only do we know that he needs to go and where he's hiding, but what his weak spot is, know exactly who to send to it. But then in the end, how do we know the deal has been done? I want to turn to the validation that we have, which is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you could turn to uh, John chapter 20. Today on Easter, we will celebrate the risen Lord because what that shows us is that he slew the dragon and gave us victory. Chapter 20, verse, uh, in chapter, uh, excuse me, the book of John, chapter 20, it says, early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciples, the one whom Jesus loved. And she said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. And Peter and the other disciples started out of the tomb, out for the tomb, and they were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He stooped and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. And then Simon Peter arrived and went inside, and he also noticed the linen linen wrappings lying there. And while the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings, and then the disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in and saw, and he saw and believed. For until then, they still hadn't understood the scriptures that said Jesus must rise from the dead And then they went home. Jesus was risen. He had accomplished his mission. He had unseated Satan from this world and would begin to rule. The uh, last point on your uh, explorer sheets is, you know, given this amazing understanding of what Christ has done, how should that affect our lives? Just to ask you, how has Christ affected your life? Has what he's done made a difference? The challenge for you today is to stop living in fear and to take your own stand. James 4, uh, verse 6 says, uh, He gives grace generously as the scriptures say. 
God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. See, he points to that same weak spot in every single one of us, which is pride. That we're unwilling to acknowledge our need for him and to turn to him. And what's the advice that James gives? It says, so humble yourselves before God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come close to God, and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and this world. God is seeking for us to draw near through what he's done. He has paved the way. He's removed all barriers. And the question comes back, what are you waiting for? Will you respond? Ephesians 6.10 talks about for Christians, right, as we have embraced the victory that Christ had over Satan, there is that challenge for us as well to be strong in the Lord. Ephesians 6, 10, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put, all, put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against the strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. I don't know if you understand it or not or can appreciate it, but what's happening in the world right now, you turn on the television, you listen you know, to the politicians and the things going on around us, and you might think, you know, these are just decisions humans are making, but the scriptures say there's something evil going on behind the scenes. And the question is, how are you going to take your stand? Will you take your stand based on the power that we have access through what Christ has done? I encourage you, stop living in fear and to take your stand in the finished work on the cross and in the confidence of the resurrection. Let me take a moment to pray for you. Appreciate you all being here, and I I hope you uh, enjoy your time with family. And and, uh, all I can say is don't be a stranger. Definitely feel free to to come and and, uh, worship with us regularly. And uh, we need to be fed on a regular basis, and, uh, and I hope you understand that. So let me take a moment to pray for you. Lord God, today we, uh, we rejoice. We rejoice in the fact that uh, you knew exactly what needed to be done. You knew who our true enemy was. Yes, we were uh, sinners and, and we rejected you, but there was one standing uh, in this world who was seeking to blind the minds of unbelievers and trying to keep people from the truth and to continue to reign over the hearts of those under his uh, clutches. But Lord, you broke into this world. You came to this earth as a man, and you died in our place. And I think uh, Satan during that time probably thought he was victorious, maybe just for a moment. But then he realized that he fell right into the clutches of, of a plan that would bring liberty to souls who needed you. So, Lord, we rejoice today that... Uh, that anyone who trusts in you will not be put to shame, that they will understand that, that we have a relationship with you through the, the debt that you've paid and that you could reign in our lives. So, Lord, we are grateful today that the, those spikes that were in your cross became the nails in Satan's coffin, that he would never affect the world as he did. And, Lord, we, we look forward to his final vanquishing and being cast into the lake of fire, and we long to see all of your kingdom come to this earth. But until then, help us to live for you. Help us to to fill our lives with the good resources that we need to take our own stand. And Lord, I pray for anyone here who's struggling with fear or uncertainty that they don't uh, give into it, that they understand they have access to power in you. So we thank you this day in Jesus' name. Amen.